Hello friends, welcome to Pioneer of Success. This is the fourth video of Cyclic Voltammetry series. In this video, I am going to talk about the characteristics of cyclic voltagrams for a non-faradic supercapacitor or electrical double layer capacitor. Supercapacitors are important in electrochemistry and the characteristics of those supercapacitors are measured by cyclic voltammetry. So cyclic voltammetry is a unique tool to characterize these supercapacitors. Today in this video, we are going to cover the qualitative aspects of cyclic voltagram for this kind of supercapacitor systems. We will not cover quantitative details in this particular video. However, we will have follow-up videos where we will be estimating these currents for a supercapacitor quantitatively. And those videos will be very much helpful for learning. So let us initially start with a basic cyclic voltagram for a capacitor, ideal capacitor. If we take an ideal capacitor from an electronic circuit and put it across the cyclic voltagram, like if you just put those two ends across the reference and working electrode, then you will be getting a cyclic voltagram like this. So, in a cyclic voltagram, as you know, the voltage varies from a negative value to a positive value and then again comes back to the initial negative value. So, it basically forms a triangular kind of wave. Now, if I just show the animation for ideal capacitor, so the this diagram will show the voltage variation and herein, will be seeing the current variation. So you can see for, for a cycle, the current varies as a rectangle. Now, ideal, this is for an ideal system, but in real system, there might be resistances involved. There might be some other kinetic effect and due to all those effects, there will be deviation from this rectangular or ideal rectangular behavior. Like in this diagram, we have shown if there is a resistance, then the re what happens to a resistor? It follows a ohmic law. So in ohmic law, what happens when you increase the voltage, the current also increases linearly. So this particular line shows linear increment of current. Now, if you just imagine you have a capacitive system and in series you have a resistor. So the resistor will act like this black dotted line and this particular one will act for the capac ideal capacitor. Now if you add them up, the resultant current will be shown by this dashed line. So this is how it should look like. But still in real situation, we don't get this rectangle, even we don't get this parallelogram we get something different, so we'll be coming to that. But before that, let me just tell you for ideal capacitor, why the current should be like this for positive value of voltage. So it is like this for this part of voltage, the current is positive and for the downward part of the voltage, the current is negative. And there is a sudden change from the negative to the positive value. So basically current uh, in, in ideal capacitor, the current will be either a constant positive current or a constant negative current. We get the positive current for this upward shift and we get the negative current for this downward shift. Now I was talking about why the current would be constant for this kind of ideal capacitor. So we all know that capacitor, this is the characteristics equation for a capacitor that is delta Q is equal to C into delta V where C is the capacitance and delta Q is the change of charge and delta V is the change of the voltage. Now if I divide it by delta T then it becomes like this the left hand side becomes delta Q by delta T and this becomes C into delta V by delta T. So you can imagine Basically, in cyclic voltagrams, we are basically giving this del V del T. So, this particular line indicates this del V del T. And dQ dt is nothing but current. Say, we define it by I. 
Now in a cyclic voltagram, you can see this is linearly varying. So this delta V over delta T will always be a constant value because slope of a line linear system is always constant. So what you can see if the capacitance is constant, this part is also constant from the cyclic voltagram voltage variation. So I should be constant. So again, I'm telling the right hand side C is constant because the capacity of the system is constant and also del V del T is constant as the current voltage is varying linearly. So the right hand side is a constant. So the current is constant and that's why we get a constant current. Now I go to engineering design of a supercapacitor. So what is there in a supercapacitor? So this is the, those are the parts of a supercapacitor. So what we have, so the black part, this is the electrode and this is the heart of the story. So what happens on an electrode? So this electrode is basically dipped into an electrolytic solution and that particular electrode has surface charges. Say it has a surface positive charge. So what happens when it is dipped into an electrolyte? The negative ions come over to it and it forms a layer. So it has the ability to attract the negative ions towards it and thereby it stored charge and this is called a supercapacitor or electrical double layer capacitor. But the total system is like this. There is a current collector, there, there is an electrode and on the other side also there is another current collector and an electrode and sometimes there is a separator. So you can imagine there are two plates or two electrodes dipped into an electrolytic solution and in the middle of these two electrodes you have a separator and those entire system that entire system is connected by two current collector so that the current can be flown through the external circuit so there are charges on this particular electrode and if you add a current collector to this electrode it will actually flow the current from the external circuit and if the capacitor is charged you can actually put a load here suppose you have a light you have a bulb here so the super capacitor will be able to glow the bulb or the led whatever you put here so how exactly the charge distributes when you dip this kind of electrode into an electrolytic solution so one thing we have to understand in an electrolytic solution we have positive ions and negative ions positive ions are called cations and the negative ions are called anions now from our chemistry knowledge we know those ions try to be in a solvated state so what is a solvated state there are solvent molecules and a particular charge ion tries to be adhered by the solvent molecules so if you look at this particular diagram so this particular charge it has surrounded say water molecules because maybe in this case the sol solvent is water so every ion like this may be solvated but when uh, we actually consider the electrode interface at the electrode interface, non-solvated, oppositely charged ions sit very nearby. That means along the interface, non-solvated, opposite ions adhere and it mostly neutralizes the electrode charge. And then the solvated ions come. There are multiple theories for this arrangement and we will be talking about the multiple theories about this double layer formation in the next video but today I am just explaining this is the most acceptable model and in the acceptable model what they say that the non-solvated oppositely charged ions will come initially then there will be a solvated layer of ions and these two layers are immobile immobile means it sticks on the surface and it does not move at all 
and this two layer the first layer is called inner helmonge layer and the second layer is called outer helmonge layer and away from this we have solvated ions and they are free to move but in these two layers they are not free to move and the entire system is called electrical double layer now let me talk about the potential due to the adherence of non solvated ions the most of the charges get compensated here in and that's why the potential there is a sudden potential drop across this inner and outer helmonge layer and then it gradually diminishes so the slope is very high here but this other part the slope is very low so in the diffuse layer there is a very slow variation of the voltage and most of the variation we see in the inner and outer helmonge layer now few points to be noted here and those i have mentioned as key points so surface charge of electrode is important so whichever we use as electrode material for a super capacitor should have sufficient surface charge so that it can attract ions it should have high surface to volume ratio this is another point if we have high surface to volume ratio there will be high accumulation of charges and how it is basically done sometimes we prefer porous electrodes so the porosity is important because as porosity increases the surface area also increases so it increases the ion holding capacity stability of the electrode material is also important because if you are using if you are using electrodes and dipping them into into a solution the electrode should be stable in that electrolytic solution otherwise there will be inefficiency of the super capacitor now commonly used materials for electrodes are activated carbon a few i have jotted down nowadays there are multiple other materials which are being used but few i have just jotted down and those are carbon fiber cloth carbide derived carbon carbon aerogel graphite sometimes graphene and carbon nanotubes those are the oldest materials which are being used as super capacitor electrode materials there are other materials as well i am telling again so those are the different models i am not talking about them in detail in today's video but in the next video we'll be talking about them i am just briefly talking about three different models the first model says there will be only one immobile layer and that's all and the second one says there will be one there will be no immobile layer there will only be diffuse layers and the third one says what we have discussed previously that inner inner helmonge plane outer helmonge plane and then then there is a diffuse layer so again i am telling we will be talking about those models quantitatively in the next video now let me talk about some uh, this is the ideal uh, super capacitor so those are the two electrodes um, inner helmonge plane outer helmonge plane and then the diffuse layer and in uh, these two electrodes are separated by a separator so the equivalent circuit looks like this so this two part that is inner helmonge plane and outer helmonge plane form the main capacitor so we have basically two capacitor in series the left part forms a super capacitor the right electrode also forms another super capacitor and that's why there are two capacitors c1 and c2 and uh, this part this electrode may offer some resistance that's why there is a re in series that is resistance due to electrode again there is another electrode so this part is resistance due to this particular electrode and this it should be the resistance due, due to the medium so we have an electrolyte in between two electrodes so that electrolyte may offer some resistances and there might be some leakage resistance which will, which will be in parallel with them so that could be a possible uh, equivalent circuit for this particular system we'll be talking about the equivalent circuits for different system in the upcoming videos as well in this video we are just briefly touching upon the concept so that we can understand 
about supercapacitor and they and their characterizations by CV. Here I talk about the deviations of supercapacitor cyclic voltage because of three different main reasons. So I have already mentioned ideal capacitor should look like this. It should show, show a positive current for a positive jump of or positive sweep of potential and the negative current for negative sweep of potential. But the magnitude of the current should be constant. But in real scenario, we see something, the CV curves for uh, non-faradic system looks something like this. And this particular thing happens due to rate limitation. I'll talk about what rate limitation is, but mostly you can think uh, what happens when you dip the electrode, there are ions and the ions, ions, ions have to come near the electrode and that should take some time because the process should not be instantaneous. It should have some time scale. So because the ions come by diffusion and diffusion may be a slow process. Although the length scale is very less, but diffusion is also very sluggish or flow due to the external electric field may also have some time scale and because of that we get deviation and the curve looks like this. In this particular part it shows if there is an electrolyte degradation. So what happens sometimes the electrolyte you are using uh, and when you apply the potential across the electrodes then there might be chances of electrolyte electrolysis and because of the electrolysis sometimes you get a kind of faradic current uh, at the corner or at the edges. So it only happens when there is a break of electrolyte. That means electrolyte is being electrolysed. Then this thing happens and you will get a curve like this. And this curve is for pseudo capacitance. Sometimes there some Faradic reaction happens on supercapacitor as well. And this Faradic reaction enhances the charge holding capacity that those kind of capacitors are called pseudo capacitors. In pseudo capacitors, you may expect to get faradic peaks like this, like oxidation and reduction peaks. So those are three major examples wherein we see different kind of nature of supercapacitor and different reasons are responsible behind this nature. I'll be talking about the effect of so, uh, 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 effect of sweep that is the scan rate how fast you are scanning that is very important because uh, if we just think logically if we scan very fast that means we are basically allowing the voltage turnover or voltage changeover with a very short time so there are less scope of getting the charge accumulated near the electrode and that actually alters the nature of the cyclic voltammetry and uh, and here i have taken an example so if you see the first one so the voltage changes and that gives you this red colored cyclic voltage now what happens uh, if we just reduce the scan rate so next time we are reducing the scan rate the red one is for 100 millivolt per second and then we are getting this one this one is for 50 millivolt per second so you can see the scan rate is low so it is allowing more time for the collection of the ions towards the electrode surface so once it allows more and more time what happens it goes towards the ideal nature because if you allow sufficient time then it will have sufficient time for the accumulation of the charges onto the electrode surface and that will make a kind of ideal supercapacitor and then gradually you will be getting a kind of rectangular curve. If you see this example in 10 millivolt per second this particular curve it is almost a rectangle but you will never get a perfect rectangle because of this time scale and all because even though your scan rate is very less then also you will need some time at least to accumulate the charges and that's why perfect 
rectangle will never get but it will be near to rectangle and that will happen for a very very slow scan rate so that concept we should have if you are working with cyclic voltammetry and especially supercapacitor in this slide i am going to give you two examples the effect of voltage window we have already talked about if you just see this particular diagram say for 0.8 up to 0.8 voltage there were no peak but as we keep on changing the voltage window for the cyclic voltagram then if you can see from 1, 1 1.2 and 1.4 we are keep getting uh, this kind of peak and this is happening due to electrolysis so at a higher voltage the electrolysis is more that's why we are getting a more sharper peak here you can see as the voltage changes voltage increases we are getting sharper corners and again i am telling this is happening due to the electrolysis and this one we have already discussed so here you can see for different scan rate as the scan rate is becoming very less we are almost getting a square kind of a square kind of cd now from the entire discussion the take home message is I have jotted down few points and those are very important. Pure non-faradic systems, the system does not show peaks in CD. So we have seen like non-faradic system does not show oxidation and reduction peak. That is why, that is what I have jotted down. The second point is in real supercapacitor system, we hardly get the ideal rectangular shape at CV. So this is very important. We should get a rectangle for an ideal capacitor but super capacitors are not ideal and that's why we never get a perfect rectangle. This point is very important. The most common reasons behind getting non-ideal shapes are ion transport and scan rate correlation I have already talked about resistive components due to the internal cell resistance and other if you remember <coughs> in our first slide we talked about the effect of resistance there might be combined effect of ion transport and resistance and the combined effect of ions transport and resistance gives you the typical shape which we get for the supercapacitors the c point is high voltage window i have already talked about if the voltage has a high window, there are chances to getting corners in the cyclic voltagrams and those are coming due to the electrolysis of the electrolyte. Stability of the electrolyte is similar and the appearance, appearance of faradic reaction sometimes uh, in, we have already discussed in pseudo capacitors there are some reactions going on on the electrode surface and if there is such reactions then you will be getting Faradic peaks. Accurate characterization of EDLC require optimized scan rate and voltage window. So this is very important as we keep on going with this course I will tell more about it but this part is very important for accurate characterization you should optimize your scan rate and voltage window and this could be case specific which material you are using for your electrode what is its shape, how exactly you have prepared your supercapacitor. I mean, on all this, your things will depend and you have to optimize the scan rate and the voltage window. And the last point is an accurate understanding of all non-ideal contributors help in deciphering the charge storage phen phenomena for real supercapacitor. Because if you are uh, designing, say, three different supercapacitors, you may get three different nature of the cyclic voltammetry. But once we understand all the background effects, then we can realize what's going on in your supercapacitor system. And that will help you to understand about your system. And with this hope, we have created this video. I hope the people who are working with supercapacitors, this video will help them. So we'll again come with the quantitative videos because obviously only qualitative understanding is not 
everything we need to understand the things quantitatively then only engineering completes because uh, the qualitative understanding gives gives us the concept but quantitative estimation gives us the real engineering so we'll be talking about that in the upcoming videos if our videos are helpful kindly share those videos and subscribe to my channel